Old School Lane Casual Chats is brought to you by OldSchoolLane.blogspot.com and is associated with Channel Frederator, Manic Expression, The Comic Book Cast, and The Araminta Show. A dream is a wish your heart makes when you're fast asleep in dreams you will lose your heartaches whatever you wish for you keep have faith in your dreams and someday your rainbow will come smiling through no matter how your heart is grieving if you Keep on believing the dream that you wish will come true. La da, la da dee, la da da, la da, la da da dee, la da, la da da dee, da 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 da, la dee, la da 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 da, la dee. La da da da, la dee. No matter how your heart is grieving, if you keep on believing the dream that you wish will come true. Hello everyone, welcome to a new episode of Casual Chats. I am Patricia and I am back with Chris, aka Rowdy C. Welcome back, Chris. Yo and hello. So uh, over the past couple of years, we have talked a lot about Disney, whether it be the Disney Renaissance era, the Disney Golden era, and the Disney Toon movies. Today, we're going to be going over to the next era of Disney films in the form of the Disney Silver era or the Disney Restoration era, as some fans like to call it. So uh, for those who are new to this podcast and you don't know what we're referring to when it comes to the era, so Disney fans like to separate the films into seven different eras. So this time around, we're going to be talking about the Disney Silver Era, which happened from 1950 to 1967. So the Disney films we're going to be talking about today consist of the following. Uh, We're going to be talking about, um, let me just bring up my list, hold on. So as Pat Trish was saying, the the list of the Silver Era films that we're going to be talking about were released in a pair of, I believe, this chronological order, Cinderella, Alice in Wonderland, Peter Pan, Lady and the Tramp, Sleeping Beauty, 101 Dalmatians, The Sword in the Stone, and The Jungle Book. That's correct. And the reason why we're doing this is because that Cinderella debuted in theaters on March of 1950, which means that it is currently celebrating its, I believe, its 70th anniversary. So 70 years ago on March of 1950, that was when Cinderella premiered on theaters. And this is the movie that pretty much kickstarted Disney back after they were releasing a lot of, um, you know, two, um, you know, two part films or shorts during the World War II era. So uh, Cinderella was the one that came out first and it was like praise when it first came out. It, they um, a lot of critics called it, you know, Disney's best film since Snow White. And it was it was for all intents. Well, our fans to this day say the movie that essentially saved Disney back then. They were, they really did struggle to get back on their feet out, like you said, after suffering a lot of setbacks during the wartime period and all of the cost-cutting, those compilation films as they would have had to put together. There was a time when they wondered if, back then, if they could have kept the animation studio going. And uh, Cinderella was, for all intents, kind of a Hail Mary for the company in releasing it. And fortunately, it succeeded on just about every level they had hoped for and helped them get back into viability. Yeah, for sure. And uh, yeah, so let's talk about this movie. So 
Um, yeah, Cinderella was based off of the classic fairy tale. And um, yeah, I think that, you know, the reason why that um, they wanted to go back, I guess, you know, after they were done doing their compilation films and their shorts, they wanted to go back to basics. And since they started off with Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, which was a classic fairy tale, they decided to do the same thing with Cinderella. And yeah, I think this was like the... Um, the, you know, the, this was like their second princess movie because it's kind of funny that, you know, Disney would be known for their princess movies, even though there's only been like a dozen over like 60 plus movies that they've done. So, yeah, I mean, a lot of people seem, you know, it's, it's become a classic for a lot of people. I mean, they pretty much know the story about how, you know, a girl named Cinderella and her father live together in happiness in this uh, rich mansion. And um, he, the father felt that Cinderella needed a mother. So he remarried and she had already two daughters from a previous marriage. Then the father died, and so the stepmother raised her, and she pretty much treated her with uh, cruelty and treated her like a slave. And so, you know, one day there's this ball coming about because the king wants the pr you know his son, the prince, to get married so that he can have grandchildren. And uh, you know, Cinderella wants to go to the ball, but she can't because her stepmother wants her to stay home, and she doesn't want to be. Um, you know, she's always been jealous by her beauty, and so. You know, she forces her into all these chores and then her colorful companions, which consists of birds and mice, help her make the dress while she's being um, while she's being busy with her chores. And then, you know, the dress gets destroyed by the stepsisters. And then she, there's a fairy godmother that comes by and helps her out. She goes to the ball. Her and the prince have this dance together that they start having an affection towards one another. The clock strikes midnight while the spell is slowly being broken. She runs off and the only thing that's left is the glass slipper. And yeah, you I mean, a lot of people pretty much know the story in and out. And, you know, this is kind of like one of the movies that had pretty much, um, you know, I mean, I guess additional to Snow White as well, that pretty much like started off like the whole damsel in distress thing about like, oh, you know, why doesn't Cinderella do anything about it and stuff like that, which, you know, I, I, I really, you know, I guess I could understand some parts of it, but then there's some parts that I really don't understand in terms of like the damsel in distress thing. I'm going to say that this is, this is definitely um, one of the top movies in, um, Disney's library that gets a yeah a lot of criticism for shall we from shall we say um, the more jaded generations of present day. This is a but this is a film that I myself have gone back and looked at again in more recent years, even before Disney Plus was released, mind you. And yeah, this, to, to me, there's a lot more to this story in just trying to pa just paint a, a traditional supposed damsel in distress story. First off is the fact that you know, contrary to popular belief, what everyone says, yeah, Cinderella wasn't even wanting to go to this ball to meet to, to meet someone who would marry her off and take her out of that life. It was never in her in her consideration. To be perfectly honest, no one knew, I believe, in, within the context of the story, exactly that the entire purpose of the ball was to get the prince married. And as you pointed out, it wasn't even the prince's intent from the beginning. This thing was all set up by his father who was essentially going through a midlife crisis and wanting grandchildren. That's something that kind of gets overlooked um, throughout much of, of the story. But it really is more or less a story about how even through everything she was put through by her stepfamily throughout the years is the fact that Cinderella still did her absolute best to maintain a positive image and outlook on life and never herself become cruel and jaded herself and always tried to see the best in people and try to show kindness to everyone whenever possible. And speaking as someone who myself can be come very jaded and unhappy more often than I probably should be, that is still for my I take a message that perhaps we need to see more of nowadays. Hmm. Yeah, I guess you could say that because, yeah, you're absolutely right in terms of what you just said. Another thing that I also have to mention about this is that this is the movie that brought, um, uh, you know, beautiful, detailed animation again. You know, some, akin to what we had with Snow White and Pinocchio, Fantasia, and, um, and, you know, Bambi, in which, like, 
you know, they were able to have bigger budgets again and they were able to create such lavish, you know, background scenes. And it's so detailed and colorful. Like I watched it recently on Disney plus to get myself prepared for this podcast. And it still looks amazing by the way. I mean, you, you know, every, you know, the colors and just the backgrounds and just the designs of everything. is just unbelievable. Yeah, you talk, well, you talk about the animation. I, I myself, um, from the number of times I've looked back and rewatched this in recent years, I've actually been even more impressed by the storytelling and the writing itself. It just goes to show you how Walt and his uh, team of Purdue creators at that time were much better than people wanted to sometimes give them credit for in better fleshing out these stories and really doing some things to fill in what probably were some plot holes in the original stories. We talked already about the actual motivation for um, giving the prince the ball to meet all these girls and whatnot. But one thing I always just will never forget and always just really admire is they actually created a scenario that explains how Cinderella could lose that shoe at the end of the ball. It's actually a plot detail early on in the movie. They show that she has this problem with having shoes flip off. It happens early in the movie. It happened at the end in the wedding scene. They actually took the time that if you actually pay attention and watch to explain how something like that could happen. That to me is the, it's those little details from the writing perspective that have really impressed me above perhaps all else. Yeah, absolutely. And can we just say about how Lady Tremaine is definitely one of the best Disney villains ever shown? It definitely, and of course, yeah, it, it's definitely just just how absolutely kind of subtle and yet not subtle it is as well. It just puts on that there's it, 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 it kind of it kind of be uh, difficult to describe in um off the top of my head's words, but it, there is they do just paint a kind of a kind of dark shadow over her that she doesn't need to be excessively violent and threatening to be to be uh, this just outright evil personality. However, at the same time, you know, I do I will say that you know we've given the, the sequels and their and their like the the kind of dressing down they probably deserve, but I did like the fact they tried to give at least some of the some of the sisters, in particular Anastasia. A bit more character go on on there, but yeah, they they did do a really good job in just the fact that in very subtle ways, just um, making Lady Tremaine one of the most intimidating presences. I think that's the word I was looking for in just all, all of Disney lore. Right, exactly. And uh, yeah, we did talk about the Cinderella sequels in the Disney Toon Studios podcast, where I did see two, but I did not see three. But you already saw um, both of them. But yeah, um, if you want to listen to, um, you know, our thoughts on it, then go go back and listen to that. So um, yeah, and I think that, um, you know, I, I guess right before we, you know, go over to the next film, let's talk about the remake that came out in 2015. Now, I I haven't seen it, but I have heard from a lot of people, especially since we have the bajillion live action Disney remakes now, that a lot of people say that, you know, this and another movie we'll be talking about a little later is one of the better Disney uh, live action remakes. Yeah, well, I, I want to have to confess I have that, never actually seen that remake myself either, but it, it, it's definitely one that it came out before... The, the, before we really realized that how much of a trend the remakes were going to be. So perhaps people were able to give it a bit more slack in a time period before they really started the public, at least the online public, seemed to get really sort of tired of the multiple remakes. And yeah, maybe it did give it its own subtle differences when needed. But like I said, unfortunately, I can't speak too much of it because I never took the time to really watch it myself either. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Cinderella as a live action remake, I completely understand because there are some things in the animated movie that have aged a little bit, such as the character portrayals. 
like the prince has pretty much no personality and um you know some of the motivations are a little bit lacking like i completely understand that they did try to bring that back in the live action remake from what i understand and i also heard that they're not you know the animals don't talk so that they can be able to build in the relationship between cinderella and the prince and they gave a backstory to cinderella's stepmother and all that stuff so that from the stuff that i've heard and you know, with Kevin Brana also doing like lavish productions that is kind of akin to what happened in the original movie, which, you know, I, I really want to see it. I think it's on Disney Plus and I do need to take a look into it. So I definitely will have the chance. But uh, yeah, I think that that for the most part, you know, the, something like Cinderella, I can understand having a live action remake. Something like The Lion King, I completely disagree. Like, that movie should have not exist because it's perfectly fine the way it was. And you want to know the sad thing about this is, and uh, I'm just going to briefly talk about this. So I was in the middle of working on, um, like, a, uh, like a, a project. Like, um, you know, I was working with ABC on something. I, I can't really say what it is yet. Um, but uh, I was working, you know, with some of the people who – you know, we were um, okay. So one of the direct, uh, one of the producers of of this uh, the project, he was talking about uh, the Disney movies, the live action Disney movies, and he was talking about the Lion King. And he brought it up, and he said that you know a live action setting works so much better than the animated section because he doesn't like cartoons. He thinks that they're kid stuff, and the fact that they were able to have it more live action was something that he was able to tolerate. And I think that. Maybe for some adults, I can see that and that I can see that perspective that they think that, you know, if it's a cartoon, then that means it's for kids. And if they, you know, take these classic Disney movies and they make it live action, maybe it'll make adults watch it much easier, which I don't agree with. But I mean, for some people, I mean, I can understand where they're coming from. Mm hmm. But yeah, so I, I think that another thing that I have to mention is that. Um, there's a particular voice actress uh, who, um, it, you know, when we're talking about the Disney Silver era, she has pretty much been in almost every single one of the movies we're going to be talking about. And the, the person I'm referring to is Verna Felton. Now, for the Cinderella, she is the voice of the fairy godmother. And then we'll, uh, you know, talk about the other things but she, that she voiced in overall. But, yeah, like, she has voiced practically almost every, like, a major character in, like, a Disney movie that happened throughout the 50s and 60s. I mean, th think of it like, you know, John, uh, like, John, um, uh, what was his name? Uh, John, you know, the guy who voices Ham or um or pt flea or any of those characters in pixar it's kind of like the equivalent of that in a way well the, so there were, no, well, there were a number of such perform actors um uh, it, of this time period members who i was most would like to call walt disney's own acting troupe you have guys like ed Wynn, sterling holloway sebastian cabot we're gonna see a number of uh, performers there are probably especially in a number of these movies in particular th throughout this time period yeah, for sure. Absolutely. But I just I just noticed that part and I just thought it was actually pretty funny. So, yeah, I guess, um, you know, overall with Cinderella, it, it's you know, it's it, it was the movie that pretty much kickstarted, you know, Disney to come back in a major way after they were almost bankrupt during World War Two. And this is the movie that that has become a staple in Disney, whether it be when, you know, like Cinderella's castle in Disney world or any of the characters, some of the songs like, you know, bibbity boppity boop. So, you know, it's, it still remained a, a classic for a lot of people. And I can, you know, definitely attest to, I can definitely agree to that. I definitely do think that, you know, at this time period, it is one of the best Disney movies that came out. All right, so let's talk about the next movie, uh, Alice in Wonderland, uh, based off of the really crazy books by Lewis Carroll. And yeah, um, you know, we have a little girl named Alice and she's completely bored with life. She wants everything to be kind of like a little strange. And then she finds this white rabbit and, you know, she follows him and then she falls into like this hole in a tree and then she lands herself in wonderland where she meets up with a whole bunch of colorful characters and um yeah there are some things that they did stretch out from the book or and you know but for the most part it's you know one of the more accurate portrayals and um you know when it comes to like disney adapting things from a book so 
Um, I have to it, say that. Oh, go ahead. It is. It is. For the most part, it's kind of a mishmash of both of Lewis Carroll's two primary creations, Adventures in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass, kind of meshed together. And that's one of the criticisms I think some people probably have. For those not aware, um, this was actually the subject of my very first crossover review in my early years with Steve the Filminator. And I'm going to say this. It's it's one that, you know, Steve's a nice guy. His, um, his views of uh, the movie are his and his alone. I kind of regret the tone I took on the movie when I reviewed it. I think we should have probably done it much more in a type of good cop, bad cop situation, because in real life, this is probably my favorite Disney film that came out prior to the Disney Renaissance. This is one of the ones uh, I first like, was first reading the, the book adaptations of this film and eventually uh, watched the film itself. This is one of the movies that was frequently um, repeated and shown in the early years of the Disney Channel. And yeah, it's a lot of, uh, there's a, a lot of, uh, uh, just a lot of crazy and colorful and fun scenarios to come into. Even though, you know, Walt himself was never that satisfied with the finished product. Although he did acknowledge it at least had some type of following to make the characters of Alice in Wonderland instrumental in his creation of Disneyland just a few years later. Yeah, for sure. You know, you have the spinning teacup rides and there's a lot of, um, I think there was like an Alice in Wonderland ride. It's kind of like a boat ride akin to like, it's a small world where you get to like ride around and you get to see like the, um, the bits of the Wonderland come to life. So yeah, it, it does have its stay in pop culture for sure. You know, the Mad Hatter and the March Hare, the Cheshire Cat, the Queen of Hearts, um, yeah, I mean, like, all those characters, a lot of people still remember. And the moments are still amazing, like when Alice meets up with the flowers, and then Alice eats the eat me cookies and drinks the the potion, and, uh, you know, the, the sizes that she goes, you know, in and out, and... Um, you know, all, and, you know, all the stories that she gets to listen to and trying to figure out, you know, how to make things logical in an illogical world. It, it's just so amazing. And, you know, we have to talk about like Catherine Beaumont's portrayal as Alice because she is phenomenal in this movie. I think she was like 12 years old when she played as Alice and it's just amazing. Yeah, <laughs> it goes back to just the, you know, the subject of how back then, Disney used that not only used the, the voice talent themselves, but actually were directly pursued individuals that not only could provide voices, but be almost be a stamp in models for the characters' designs before for them. They did it, of course, with the original Snow White in that first movie, and you know Miss Beaumont herself was um, was more was very instrumental in providing the character design for the character of Alice herself. And um, in addition to providing the voice, and, and of course, this won't be the only film that we'll talk about Catherine Beaumont providing a voice um, as well. Right. And, uh, you know, speaking, going back to Verna Felton, she was the voice of the Queen of Hearts. And, um, yeah, like her portrayal is just so over the top and crazy. Like, have you know, every time even the little inkling of something bad going on, she, you know, orders them to get their heads chopped off. That's actually pretty scary. Yeah. Oh, uh, there's definitely, it is a definite uh, contrast of the two villains of these next two films. They wanted someone just very subtle and imposing with uh, Lady Tremaine, but. For this type of setting of Alice in Wonderland, you almost need someone who's just completely over the top and bombastic to fit the setting that this movie takes place in. Exactly. Yeah, for sure. And, um, you know, I, I also really like this one as well. I mean, it's a tie between like, um, you know, I think that Alice in Wonderland is you know, my favorite out of the silver era. I, you know, I, it's actually funny because we never talked about like what are our favorites or our least favorites whenever we talk about a particular era. So yeah, I, I mean, you know, either, um, you know, Alice in Wonderland is probably my favorite out of the eight uh, movies that came out that uh, particular era. Well, it's, it, you know, I, I really love this movie so much that I was just kind of really angry at 
Tim Burton's um, Alice in Wonderland movie. I just hated that movie so much when it first came out. I, I I mean, you know, I mean, I've softened it a little bit since then, but then, you know, the Alice Through the Looking Glass movie just kind of was, like, really confusing and just a giant CGI fest with, like, time travel and all that stuff. It's just, I don't know. I mean, and I, I haven't, I mean, seen, I haven't and if, seen the Looking Glass movie myself, but I will say this of the, uh, you have the Tim Burton Alice in Wonderland. It was kind of in reverse for me. I kind of was okay with the first, uh, first viewing of it. Mainly because, I'm not kidding about this, when I first saw Hook as a kid, my mind automatically started trying to come up with a similar type of movie for Alice in Wonderland. And it actually, it, I actually, some of the ideas, well, I, I never completely fleshed them out to make an actual full-length movie of it, some of the ideas I thought of for a potential Alice in Wonderland sequel ended up getting put into this Tim Burton's version, believe that or not. Over the years, though, I did begin to give it a second look at seeing at least I could understand why a number of people uh, were a bit cold on the Burton uh, on the Burton remake. I could give it that much. Yeah, sure. All right. Yeah. So. Um, I think, yeah, but here's, uh, so yeah, Alice in Wonderland has been adapted so many times, you know, because, um, you know, very similar to like the likes of, you know, Snow White and Cinderella and all those things, it's in the public domain. So I've seen a lot of interpretations of Alice. I've, I know a lot of books about Alice. There's a lot of TV specials about Alice. There's American McGee's Alice, which is a video game. So I've seen the, I've seen seen, you know, Alice uh, and its stories of Wonderland done in such creative and unique ways. Some of them not for the good, but at least I can see where they were coming from. And I, I felt the same way at first for, you know, uh, Tim Burton's interpretation of Wonderland as well. But I just felt that it ju there were just some decisions that I just didn't really like. But that's just me. Uh, another thing that I have to talk about in terms of, um, you know, at this uh, movie is the fact that, um, you, uh, you know, with, um, you know, the messages about, you know, it has actually one of the the saddest scenes in the movie in which when Alice, you know, is wandering around and she's completely lost and then she ends up in this dark part of the forest where she starts crying and all the animal other animals are starting to cry too. It's like, I, I really like the way that that scene is portrayed because, you know, she has been surrounded by so much color and so much wackiness. But then when she's at her lowest point and thinking about what she said earlier about that, she wanted to have, you know, no logic in the real world. And then when she finally gets it, you know, it gives her that lesson about, like, be careful what you wish for. And the whole, you know, background that she's surrounded in is completely black. And I think that that's genius. And then when, you know, she starts crying, the light starts coming up. And then we have the scene in which when you know, um, you know, finally she's able to find her right direction. And I, I think that for the most part, you know, I thought that that scene was done very well. I mean, everything was just like all crazy and wacky and colorful. And then she goes into this really sad, depressing scene. I've seen that uh, scene at least a few times in like top 10 saddest Disney moments. Anyway, but yeah, so I guess we can go off to, I guess, so that with, with that out of the way, uh, let's go over to the next uh, Disney movie, which is Peter Pan. And, uh, yeah, there's a lot of interpretations of Peter Pan, very similar to the book, uh, very similar to Alice in Wonderland. There's a lot of interpretations of Peter Pan because now it's in the public domain. And, um, yeah, with uh, this interpretation of Peter Pan, it's very adventurous. It's very whimsical. And um, I do like the inter I do like Captain Hook in this one. He is a lot of fun in this one. Yeah, this is definitely one of those films where I, I don't say there's a lot of polarization on 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 the on how on each individual character. This is probably one of the first Disney films where a lot of people, maybe even are watching it early on, they might have identified more with the villain than the uh, primary quote unquote hero of the movie. Because when you look at it some ways, Peter can kind of be a bit of a jerk ass in quite a few um, spots in this film. Then you have C Captain Hook, who the main thing is, he wants to come after Peter because the kid sliced off his hand and made a crocodile desire to become his lunch. And we never, he, 
the main thing is we never hear what exactly, if anything, Hook did to warrant such a fate befall him early on. And that kind of ends up making him almost somewhat sympathetic. Granted, like I said, they, they, he's still the leader of this group of mercenaries who want to, who um, early on in the movie say they'd rather be out looting ships and slitting throats. So they try their best to still portray the pirates as the villains of this movie. But due to the fact they make do it in such a colorful way and give Hook such a relatively tragic backstory, it almost doesn't succeed in that way. No, you're absolutely right, for sure. And I, I do agree that, you know, we don't under, we don't know why that, um, you know, Peter Pan has a vendetta against Captain Hook. I guess because he's one of the very few adults in this world that doesn't like the Lost Boys in him. I don't really know. I mean, but Captain Hook does have a very understandable motivation. He wants to get revenge on Peter because Peter cut off his hand and fed it to the crocodile. That makes a lot of sense. And... Yeah, I, I think that's, you know, with the most part, um, you know, with the other characters, like he, you know, him and the villains are probably the best ones in the movie because, I mean, like Peter is a, you know, Peter is a fun character at times, but you're absolutely right that he is a bit of a jerk, especially when it comes to like Wendy, where he kind of like offsets her pretty much all the time. Like, oh, you know, you know, Wendy is being mistreated by the mermaids. It's like, oh, they're just playing around, whatever. Oh, um, you know, Peter is being, you know, brought in with the Native Americans. And, oh, Wendy is, you know, being treated like a servant, having to get firewood and completely ignored. It's like, I don't blame Wendy for being angry at Peter all the time because he kind of, like, doesn't treat her very well. And... Uh, you know, and, and, you know, as for like John and Michael, I don't really remember much about them. I mean, John is like your typical smart kid and Michael is just a child, but they have practically no personality outside of that. And Wendy is, you know, she she is played very well, once again, by Catherine Beaumont, but she has even less personality than Alice so it doesn't, I don't really, you know, I mean, I do like Wendy for sure, but I don't like her as much as Alice, uh, which was her previous character that she played as. And uh, you have the Lost Boys, which, you know, again, don't really have much of a backstory because, you know, they're just boys who don't have any parents. And they're alongside with Peter causing mayhem to the pirates and Captain Hook. And then you have Tinkerbell, who you know, happens to be, you know, this um, pixie who's very jealous of Wendy and Peter together. And, you know, I I think that we would get more of a backstory with the Tinkerbell movies that would come out around the late 2000s and 2010s. But I haven't seen them personally. I know you've only seen the first one, so I can't really say too much about that. But um, yeah, I think that for the most part, you know, I think that the story is a lot of fun. I mean, I, I guess... Very similar to, like, Alice in Wonderland, in which it's very episodic. Like, you know, it goes from, like, Alice going into one place or the other. I guess it kind of feels that way sometimes about Peter Pan. It's like, you know, you have the beginning where the parents are getting ready to go over to this uh, ball. And then you have, um, you know, Peter getting Wendy, John, and Michael. And they go to Neverland. And then they go over through different segments. You know, John and Michael are with the Lost Boys looking for the Native American tribe. And Wendy is with Peter going over to the mermaids and then finding out that Tiger Lily was being captured and then focusing on Captain Hook again. So, yeah, I mean, you know, the the story is, um, I mean, it does, I mean, there's not like a major focus other than just those little bits of adventure, which is fine. I have no problems with it at all. It does does sometimes feel like with with, with these, especially with these last two movies, it's more like the the script feels like it has to follow a point-to-point schedule uh, more or less, as opposed to what we had in Cinderella, which was a much more like fleshed out tale of almost like the, of character development, so to speak. Exactly. Now, I can understand something like Alice in Wonderland, in which it had that kind of story structure, because that is how that that was how the book was written. And also, you know, Alice is supposed to represent us as a reader or in that in that in the movie's case us as a viewer we're experiencing the craziness of wonderland for ourselves 
and the characters of Wonderland represent that, you know, logic is completely out the window and they didn't need that much of a development because their personalities was able to make up for it. Not so much with Peter Pan, unfortunately. And I can understand that there were some things that they cut off from Peter Pan. Like, I've seen the musical of Peter Pan on Broadway many, many years ago, where they have the tradition about, like, Peter Pan has to be played by a woman, and the man who plays as Captain Hook also plays as the father, which they do in the movie, which I actually do commend, because the same actor who voices... Um, you know, the Mr. Darling also voices Captain Cook as well, which they do. They did keep that tradition, although they did get a teenage boy to voice as Peter Pan, which I guess does make some sense, of course. And, you know, they, they also did they didn't do the scene in which when Tinkerbell dies and then Peter says, you know, hey, you know, for all you who believe in fairies, you know, clap for the audience and you couldn't do that. And, uh, when, you know, and then I, I guess at that point in time, you know, like killing off a main character was kind of a no, no, because I, I briefly discussed about this when, um, Aaron and I were talking about the witches and the fox and the hound in which when, um, Art Stevens, one of the directors didn't want to include the original book where chief was supposed to be dead after he was hit by the train. And that's when Todd and Copper got their revenge. And, you know, our Steven says, you know, we never killed off a main Disney character. And why should we start now? Oh, by the way, I said it was Wolfgang Retherman in the podcast. So I completely apologize. It was Art Stevens who said that. But anyway, that's uh, so, yeah, um, I guess they could include the whole Tinkerbell dead scene. But and, you know, the whole Captain Hook, you know, when he's swimming away from the crocodile, that's left, you know, that, oh, you know, he made it out because we did get Peter Pan, too. So uh, that's the only one I have. You've seen that movie, though. I have not. So, yeah. Um, well, uh, let's I mean, let's finish talking about this movie right before you re, in, re uh, you know, reiterate your thoughts on that. Yeah, I said, <coughs> excuse me. Um, I said, it's very much, I said, it, it's Cap, it's what well, Peter Pan's the, the movie seems to be. Is one of those times where, with the exception of those um, small details you just mentioned, they did try to follow the story more as accurately as possible compared to what they did with Alice in Wonderland. Like you said, I did watch Return to Neverland. With the, the only thing I would say about it is, with the exception of some of, of some uh, slight alterations, it is. I think the one thing it falls at is that it's pretty much almost the same story for the most uh. part. It, does, it doesn't really go into much extra uh, development or detail. But I mean, but for what it's worth, like I said, uh, this movie is one where definitely you can um, uh, identify or interpret each character differently depending on how you see them. But maybe that's one of the reasons it still remains one of the more popular films, especially of this time period. Yeah, for sure. And also, um, not to mention that, uh, you know, this, uh, you know, Peter Pan has always been like super popular, not only in stage, but also in um, TV shows like Peter Pan and the Pirates, which was a Fox cartoon that came out of the 90s. There was the uh, disastrous NBC show with Christopher Walken as Captain Hook. And there was, uh, you know, Hook, uh, the Robin Williams movie that you mentioned earlier. There was Pan, which was um, a live action uh, Peter Pan movie that came out around the, I think it was like around the 2000s or 2010s that pretty much nobody watched when it first came out. And yeah, I mean, like, it, it's still pretty popular. You know, the story of Peter Pan itself is pretty popular. And there are planning on doing a live action Peter Pan remake because, of course they are. It's to be expected. Although I did hear from a recent article that they are not wanting to cast a Peter Pan that's white or Caucasian. They're willing to get, um, you know, somebody who is not white. You know, they, maybe they can find like a New Zealander or an Australian or, you know, somebody else that's a little bit outside of the normal p depiction of Peter Pan. So... I mean, that's an interesting choice, I have to say. I will, I'm just going to say this and get this out of the way right now. Anything you're hearing about future Disney remakes, future Disney live-action shows, who they might cast for these supposed future shows, check your sources on these. 
every single time. There's a lot of false information going out there, and here's the number one, one, one take you need to always remember, because I made a video on this. If you're, see, if, if you're hearing any information coming from a site called WeGotThisCovered.com, chuck it in the garbage. Don't believe a damn thing they say. Just my two yeah. cents on that. Oh, yeah. I, I can definitely understand that for sure. And, um, yeah, but that's what I've heard. I mean, there's been a lot of rumors about Disney movies that are going to be live action remakes. Robin Hood, um, The Great Mouse Detective, and I haven't heard anything about that. So maybe this Peter Pan one is a rumor. I'm not sure. But, you know, just take it with a grain of salt for those who are listening. There's just a lot of rumors going on there, especially just for people who want to get the Internet riled up. So I don't listen to anything until I actually see proof that the thing is in production. Okay. Yeah, that's fair enough. All right. So let's talk about the next one, which is Lady and the Tramp. Now, uh, Lady and the Tramp is a very monumental Disney film that it was the very first one that was filmed in CinemaScope, which means that out of the Disney Silver era, it was the first one that you can see on widescreen, which it does look really nice on Disney Plus if you do watch it. And um, let's see. It was... um, yeah, so basically, you know, Lady and the Tramp starts off, it takes place in 19, I think it's in 1911, and yeah, I, th- yeah, I think it is, I think, or 1909, I think it's one of them. Yeah, it's 1909. So the movie takes place in 1909, and it focuses on a couple by the name of Jim Deere and Darling, and, you know, he gives um, her a puppy for Christmas, and she names her Lady. And so we do get to see the life of Lady, where she is raised to being a pampered dog in this really nice, um, you know, neighborhood where she has her friends, Jock and Trusty, and... You know, she hears the news about like the, you know, that Darlie's going to have a baby and she doesn't understand it. And so there's this dog by the name of Tramp who comes along and says, you know, a baby is bad news for dogs because all the attention is going to go to the baby and not to the dog. And, you know, and as time went on, you know, you have, um, you know, Jim Deere and Darling going out of town. And so they have their Aunt Sarah watch over the baby and lady. And they have these Siamese cats who come along and wreck everything and, you know, she thinks that uh, Aunt Sarah thinks that uh, Lady was the one who did it, and so she gets a muzzle, and so she runs off, meets up with Tramp again, and he shows her life outside of her home and teaches her about, uh, you know, what's it like being a dog in the streets, and, uh, you know, they start having this really strong relationship together, and then it leads off to the scene in which when, you know, they're at Tony's restaurant and they get fed spaghetti and meatballs, and they have that iconic scene in which when they go together, so. Yeah, I think that um, when this movie first came out, a lot of people were very mixed with it. Some people thought it was just like a, it was too simple and it was too wholesome compared to the likes of the previous movies that came out during that time period. But a lot of critics have softened up over the years. It wasn't as much of a success compared to the other movies that came out previously or the some of the movies that came out later on, but now a lot of people seem to regard it as one of the Disney classics. Not as much as like the others, but still one nonetheless. And there and you know, it also got a live action remake, but it was exclusive on Disney Plus that came out just a few months ago. Yeah, it definitely seems like this is one of those movies that, for for me, it seems like a lot of people for years knew it existed. It's one that that Disney will bring back into light every few years once in a while. But I'm wondering if a lot of people actually remember much detail as to what the film is about. And maybe that's one of the reasons why it was perhaps a safe bet for a remake. Just the fact that... but. When you really look at it, it, it can have a, a, a good type of message going into it, as it is a story of two different cultures finding common ground with one another. It's it's almost like a precursor to it, it, the story itself. Maybe just it, it's almost like Oliver and Company in reverse without a romantic background if you could kind of tell where i'm coming from there oh yeah i could i could definitely see that you know with oliver being a kitten in the streets and then he finds his owner and then he starts getting accustomed to the luxurious life yeah i could definitely see that for sure but ultimately it's both, of, both of these are both of these were movies where the ultimate message seems to be is trying to find out 
how people from different backgrounds and different cultures can still find things in common with one another. If nothing else, that was the type of message that they were probably trying to uh, tr trying to send with a film like this. And maybe maybe because it was th that it was too subtle like that and didn't have a lot of high swashbuckling adventure, so to speak, the stuff like or craziness that the likes of Alice in Wonderland or Peter Pan had, that maybe it did kind of go over audiences' head, unfortunately. I could definitely see that for sure. Because, you know, like I mentioned before, that critics at the time just didn't really understand why Disney was kind of going a little bit backwards in, tele in, t in case of in terms of their storytelling, you know, you had, you know, adventure in Peter Pan and you had wackiness in um, Alice in Wonderland and you had the return to form in Cinderella. Something like Lady and the Tramp just kind of felt a little bit odd. I mean, c given the fact that this was based off of a Cosmopolitan magazine story that, you know, it was based off of a really short tale that was in a magazine that was written like a few decades prior that they couldn't really stretch it out. It's almost akin to what the, you know, how Disney came up with the story of Dumbo in which they were reading about the story of an elephant in a circus and stuff like that. And they decided to just go with it. So, yeah, I, I think that um, it is very subtle in its presentation. I do enjoy the fact that you do get to see the two different perspectives and you do get to um, meet up with, uh, you know, Lady and Tramp and you do get to see um, how their backgrounds were able to um you know, flesh out their way of thinking. Like, you know, with Tramp, he's constantly going from owner to owner every single day, not having a, himself like a full on home because, you know, he enjoys the freedom and he enjoys um, being able to do what he pleases. And lady who's been in one home her entire life, especially one with a family that has a good, um, you know, that are in like upper middle class, She's able to, um, you know, not have to worry about like, you know, what she's going to eat or where she's going to sleep or, you know, being lonely because she has her next door neighbors. And, you know, uh, I think that some of the characters are actually done pretty well. You know, you have um, Jock and Trusty, you know, Jock is your typical Scottish terrier. And then Trusty, who is a bloodhound who, you know, he used to be a cop dog alongside with his grandfather where they used to track criminals because bloodhounds are known for having excellent sense. So um, and then, you know, because of his age, he completely lost it. And uh, and then you get that scene in which when he finally redeems himself in the end, trying to locate Tramp when he's taken over to the dog pound. And then uh, this movie doesn't exactly have a villain either. I think that's another thing that also caused Lady and the Tramp to not really be stuck, uh, st not really stand out compared to the previous movies that came out. Is that there's not really a villain in this movie. I mean, sure, you had Aunt Sarah, but she's only in um, a few scenes in the first act and then, you know, towards the ending, but she's not really a villain. And then you have the rat who only shows up briefly a few minutes be in the beginning of the movie and then towards the end when, you know, Tramp has to capture the rat because it's about to attack the baby. So, yeah, I mean, compare this to Lady Tremaine and um, the Queen of Hearts and then Captain Hook. Yeah, I can definitely understand why some people were kind of let down with Lady and the Tramp because, you know, if we're to see from a lot of people's opinions, Disney villains are just as beloved as the protagonist, even more so. So the fact that Lady and the Tramp doesn't really have one, I guess maybe a lot of people just don't really remember this movie that much. Perhaps. Yeah, and then, you know, there's also some of the songs, too. And, you know, there's only a handful of them. Like, um, you know, like the beginning song, and then We Are Siamese, and then the song that Darling sings to the baby. And then, of course, this is, you know, Bella Notte is probably the most famous one out of all of them. But, um, yeah, I think that, you know, Cinderella had, uh, you know, some pretty good songs as well. Uh, so did Alice in Wonderland. Peter Pan, some of them... There, it's kind of like a mixed bag, in my opinion, with when it comes to songs. But, um, yeah, I think that's, for the most part, you know, Lady and the Tramp is pretty decent with its soundtrack. It's, it's probably one that you're not going to be listening to on a Disney soundtrack on Spotify or anything like that. <laughs> but, nonetheless, um, I do enjoy Lady and the Tramp. I actually do have a friend that 
um, you know, I go to I go to school with that, you know, she grew up with Lady in the Tramp, but it's actually her favorite Disney movie next to 101 Dalmatians, which we'll talk about later. And, you know, she said that the reason why she loves it is because, you know, she loves, um, you know, the, the story of Lady in the Tramp. And I think that's why people still kind of remember it because of their relationship together. So I, I briefly want to talk about the remake because I did see the remake on Disney Plus and um, I do see the things that they had to add or remove from this movie. So this movie has a, a mixed cast. Like there's a lot of people who are African American and Asian and stuff like that. There's a lot of people who are African American in this movie. Like Darling is African American and you know some of the people in this movie, you know, um and they're yeah, so um, you know, a lot of it, there was a bit of controversy of it when it first came out. It's like, you know, you know, mixing in different races in a time in which it didn't exactly make sense because it was 1909. You know, uh, there, there was, you know, there, there wasn't a lot of interracial couples back then or whatever. It's like, I don't really care about that, to be honest. I mean, it's a Disney movie. I can understand that they try to do some creative liberties to it. And also, uh, they decided to make the baby a girl instead of a boy, which th- actually makes the song that Darling sings to the babies make so much more sense. And also the the the, the addition of Aunt Sarah, um, you know, in, in the remake, uh, they decided to take the baby along with her while Aunt Sarah just watches over the dog. Um, I kind of liked it ori- the way that the original did it in which she had to watch both the dog and the baby because it gave her a reason to actually stick around. And they obviously had to cut off the Siamese song because, yeah, I mean, we I guess, you know, some people were asking me when we did the um, the the Disney golden era. It's like, why didn't you bring up the crows from Dumbo? It's like, what else do you want us to say about it? Pretty much everybody under the moon has talked about it. So why even bring it up? And yeah, I, I, I mean, like the song that they have for the remake I mean, it's fine. I mean, I could definitely understand why they had to remove the original song. Uh, I, I don't even think there are really that much Siamese cats in this movie. I think they're just like regular cats. And also the, another thing that they added in was that they gave Tramp a backstory. He talked about why he doesn't like, you know, babies, um, you know, compared to in the original where he, we don't really know why. And we understand why in the remake because, you know, his owners had a child and, you know, they one day, you know, they he was playing fetch with one of the owners. And then when he was chasing the stick and he ran back, they just drove away and he was just left to go on his own. And that's why he kind of didn't like humans anymore. And that that does make a lot of sense. And, you know, there were some additional things that they added into the movie, like they cut off the the beaver scene, but instead they actually go to a statue of a beaver as opposed to going to the zoo and getting a beaver. And also, you know, there's some additional scenes in it, like they go inside of a uh, they go inside of a boat and um, they don't do the chasing chicken scene, which I can kind of understand as well. Kind of like similar to when they didn't go to the zoo. Maybe they maybe it was because of they thought it would be like animal cruelty or something like that. Or maybe they just couldn't, t- you know, train the animals to do that kind of stuff. I don't know. But, uh, yeah, that scene is completely cut off. And um you know, and then, of course, they actually changed some of the lyrics of the Tramp song when they meet up with Peg, which, um, you know, kind of like makes it off like, you know, she's infatuated with the Tramp and she wants to go his way. They actually did tweak some of the lyrics a little bit, which, again, I can kind of understand. And uh, and in the remake, you know, Peg and Butch are adopted, which, OK, I mean, like, I'm glad they have a happy ending, but the whole point of, you know, lady going into the dog pound was that she was able to experience what dogs in the street had to go through that, you know, they go through like this miserable, you know, kind of depressing life of just being in cages and just being um, mistreated and then euthanized if the dogs are not being adopted or if they cause trouble, which is just, it, it's supposed to be eerie for that reason. So um, yeah, I mean, and that's just, um, and that's just, you know, I also, and, um, another thing, Sam Elliott as trusty is just perfect casting. That was just amazing, by the way. So yeah, um, there are some things about the remake that I do like, um, as much as the original. 
Um, there are some things that they did change, which I completely understand. And I think it's justified, especially since it would have caused controversy. But there are some things in which I don't really agree why they did the changes. So overall, I do think it's one of the better Disney remakes. Um, I can understand why they decided to bring it back, but it's not going to be one that I'm going to prefer over the original. I mean, I'm still going to hold the original pretty closely. Have you seen it, uh, Chris? No, I have not. Okay. All right, so let's go over to the next film. So the next one is Sleeping Beauty. So you actually know about the history about this more than I do. So why don't you talk about it? Yeah, this is... Whew. I'm actually sur- you guys are surprised that this movie doesn't technically end the Silver Era as it were, just because, like we were aware, this was, this was a really the, the big shot in the dark for Disney that did not become the success they wanted it to be. Believe it or not, despite the fact that it's become one of the most classic beloved films, um, in, and it, it's one of the films that really history has vindicated more than it did at the present. This was, at the time, the most expensive film for Walt to produce. I think it took something along the lines of nine years to complete. And it did not succeed very well at the box office. It got a lot of uh, mixed of uh, not many mixed to even just poor reaction from the critics at the time, and it really set Walt Disney's company back quite a bit. They had it, its its financial uh, lack of success led to a lot of um, animators getting laid off at the time, and it led to um, it was the la- end up being the last film produced by hand painted animation they switched to xerox for uh, for the next foreseeable future after this in order to be much more of a cost-cutting measure now disney has always been known for reusing animation as you've probably seen through a lot of online articles and such uh but this was it was after sleeping beauty and its more traditional hand paint animation style did not succeed financially that, it, that this really uh took full force for the next foreseeable years. Myself, this is one movie that I have a lot of back and forth mixed reactions to. It has a lot of good things about it. Maleficent is, of course, become one of the most iconic Disney villains in the entire history of its existence. There's some good comedy settings in this movie whatsoever. And I myself have said this, even back when I first watched this as a kid, Meriwether remains one of my favorite characters of all time. Yeah, even as a kid, I gravitated toward the sarcastic ones. Go figure. But um, (laughs) that having been said, there are still some flaws with the main story that haunted me even back when I first watched it. I give Disney credit for trying to flesh out what was still a very simplistic story that on its own couldn't be made into a full-length feature film. They had to do some, they had had to add some extra details to make it work as a full-length movie. Unfortunately, some of them don't work as well as I think they should. There's this whole setting that questions whether or not betrothals and arranged marriages are morally correct, because I just point out Princess Aurora and Prince Philip are betrothed from the moment Aurora is born. And then in the in, in the second half of the movie, this whole thing is called into question when Aurora and Philip meet one another, but they don't know who each other are, because especially because Aurora has been raised with the fairies in this um in, in, in this far setting to protect her, to hide her from Maleficent. So she doesn't know that she's a princess. She doesn't know that Philip's a prince when she first meets him. And this automatically um, tr- tries to bring forth some type of conflict where they, they think they're being forced to be married to someone when they're already in love with someone else. The problem is, as an audience, we know this is going to amount to nothing because we know who these characters really are. We know that this is, this is really just a red herring and sets up what really is a legit question about not being able to marry who you want to and whether or not that, that those archaic practices were good, but it doesn't go anywhere. And keep in mind, I first saw this movie before Aladdin came out. And then Aladdin came out and tackled that exact same subject 
and handled it, in my opinion, far much better. But like I said, it's those illusions of why I look back and when I see that the critics back in 1959 thought the story was pretty weak, I got to kind of agree with them on that. I do, too. I think the story is probably the weakest thing in this movie because some of the characters are done very well. Like Maleficent is awesome. I do like the fairies and um, and all, the animation is just amazing. Like you can tell that they put a lot of work into it, like nine years, like you were just mentioning earlier. And you can definitely tell because everything just looks so incredibly gorgeous. Like it's it looks like it's something out of a glass painting. And. Also, um, another thing that I really do like, I do like some, uh, you know, I do like some of the songs in the movie and I do like, um, you know, some of the, um, I, I, I mean, and you know, there's some moments in it that are actually really funny. Like I do like the interaction. I do like the fairies when they're trying to, you know, prepare for Aurora's birthday and they're trying to do everything with no magic, which I just find to be really hilarious. It's like, you know, they never cooked for Aurora for like those 16 years. So it kind of makes you wonder about like, were they living off of berries that entire time? Well, I think so. it's hinted, I think it's hinted that um, Meriwether did most of the cooking then. And this was Fla Fauna's first attempt at trying to do something as, spe as a spectacular as bake a giant birthday cake and whatnot. I think that was at least hinted, at least. But yeah, yeah, I, that 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 stuff was actually pretty funny. And then of course you have that whole battle of you know pink and blue for what the color of the dress should be, and yeah, and and you know you have the scene in which when you know Prince Philip goes over to the castle and it's being surrounded by thorns and Maleficent turns into a dragon. Like those scenes are great, but the other stuff is pretty weak. Like the motivation for Maleficent about like oh she's angry because she wasn't invited over to a baby shower just seems kind of stupid when you think about it and um you know you also have uh you know i mean the movie just wastes a lot of time throughout the third act where you have the two kings getting themselves drunk waiting for aurora to arrive and it just wastes so much time when it could be focusing on other things uh, once again very similar to cinderella the prince has practically no personality you could even argue that aurora has no personality either because she's asleep throughout the third act so, we do at yeah, least see somewhat, we do at least see some personality from Aurora in the second act for what's, for whatever that's worth. But you hit the nail right on the head about Prince Philip. One of the other things, other things that frustrated me about the, um, about, about, right, it's frustrating about the film is the entire first act, when you really look at it, Philip really doesn't do anything. It's the fairies helping him along every step of the way. And that's why I've said in some other articles and reviews the fairies are the real heroes of this movie. Exactly, right. You have a, you know, you pretty much, you know, hit it on the nail in the head. It's like the fairies are the ones who free Prince Philip. The fairies are the ones who keep Aurora safe for 16 years. Meriwether sacrifices her wish to give Aurora the ability to fall asleep as opposed to being killed. And, Aurora, you know, the fairies are the ones who give um, Philip the sword and the shield so that he can be able to fight off against Maleficent. So, yeah, you're absolutely right. The fairies are the ones who are the heroes of the movie. And that's why so, I say this. That's why I say this. You know, we, we've, you've talked already a lot about remakes and the lot. This is one film where I don't, I would say it needs a full live action remake, so to speak. What I would like to see more than just about anything else, I would like, like, like to see a mid quill animated TV series that goes fully into what Aurora's life was like those 16 years living with the fairies. Something almost akin to what we got with that little mermaid animated series that we reviewed a few years back. I'd like to see more detail as to what went on during those 16 years. I mean, that would that that would be actually really interesting, you know, because we already had the Tangled animated series in which it focuses right after um, Rapunzel was rescued from, you know, Mother Gothel, and it focuses on that. So, and you know, we also had the Lion Guard in which it focuses on um, Kion, Simba's son, and it takes place, you know, between Lion Kings one and two. So, yeah. I mean, I would love to see that. I mean, we were and for those who are wondering, oh, but, you know, it's too late. You know, it's been like 60 something years. It's like, we. what about the seven D's? 
that was an animated series based off of the Seven Dwarves that only came out just a few years ago. So seeing a, a series on Sleeping Beauty would be pretty awesome. I mean, it would definitely, um, you know, take off all of the, the funk that a lot of people felt about the Maleficent movies. So, yeah, I, I do agree that this is a movie that is kind of polarizing. The, the story is definitely one of the weakest things in this movie, and some of the characters are as well. But the stuff that it does have, like the fairies and Maleficent, are just amazing, you know, and the animation as well. Like, those things are the reason why people still remember this movie and why it did so much better when it hit home video as opposed to when it first came out. So yeah, let's talk about the uh the let's talk about the the movies that came out after Sleeping Beauty that had to be worked a lot cheaper because they were using Xerox at the time. So 101 Dalmatians. So this movie was um pretty revolutionary in its time with not only integrating the Xerox effect, but it also had uh rotoscoping, which they were able to animate all the puppies in, so they didn't have to constantly draw them over and over and over again. But it also does kind of I mean, I would say that the Xerox movies, especially the ones that are, especially like in Sword of the Stone, it definitely shows their ages because you definitely do get to see their thick pencil lines, which a lot of people kind of find distracting. Other people find it charming. I just find it to be kind of not as detailed as the previous Disney movies. But I can understand that because after the failure of Sleeping Beauty, they had to work around um, you know, much more cheaper um, limitations. And then they had to like kind of retroactively get themselves back after that financial failure. It's like the equivalent of, you know, drawing with, um, you know, animation paint and, you know, you know, and, uh, you know, painting cells and all that stuff. And then having to do flash if your movie or your TV series doesn't do very well. Yeah. Well, let's go. Let's, uh, we might as well uh, also just cut to the chase right now of all the Disney films that have ever been made. This is probably the absolute top of the list where the number one drawing factor of the film is the villain. Cruella de yes. Vil makes this movie. Let's have the, let's have, I think we have no argument about this whatsoever. It, just, it also is so funny that we are talking about, you know, it's a question that goes on along the end at all this time, like, who is the most diabolical, evil Disney villain out there? Okay, you have Maleficent, who cursed a baby out of the jealousy that she wasn't invited to her party. You got Hans, who totally manipulates, uh, who manipulates uh, Anna from the beginning, and it's just a surprise, uh, surprise twist at the very end. You got the Queen of Hearts, who wants to chop everyone's heads off. Um, the evil queen from the beginning, who's just jealous of a Snow White being pretty of her. Cruella DeVille wants to kill puppies. End of story. That's pretty much it. <laughs> a lot of people I said, like, but boo, you got someone who wants to turn puppies into fur coats. You can't top that. Yeah, she is PETA's worst nightmare. But yeah, for for the most part, yeah, this is the yeah, this is one of those quintessential movies in which like the villain makes up for the fact that the protagonists are not very interesting. And, and that, that's not to say that they're bad. I mean, far from it. But, you know, the villain just is so over the top and so memorable that she pretty much just offsets everything else. So uh, for those who don't who are not familiar with the movie, which I'm surprised because it's been adapted into two live action movies and has two animated series. But uh, but seriously, uh, for those who don't know, it's based off of a book written by Dodie Smith, and the story is about a dog named Pongo who is just bored with his life, and his um, owner is a musician, and so he decides that he wants to find a mate for not only him, but also for himself. And so he finds Anita and Perdita, and they're walking over to the park, and so he decides to... Um, you know, trick Roger into walking over to the park earlier than anticipated. And so then they they met up and then they get married. And so they have 15 puppies. And then um, Anita's friend, Corella DeVille, um, you know, sees them and she wants to buy them. And, you know, the reason why is because she wants to make them into fur coats for herself or if she wants to sell them is not actually very clear. In the remake, uh, the one that came out in 1996, she wants to make one fur coat and for herself because she's obsessed with furs. I mean, we do get that in, you know, the movie as well, where she's obsessed with furs, uh, the uh, the animated movie. And I guess she wants to make a lot of fur coats out of like 99 puppies. So 
I guess, you know, that does make a lot of sense, sure. But, um, yeah, so we have her, you know, being rejected of not getting the uh, the puppies, and so she decides to hire two thugs by the name of Jasper and Horace. They steal them, and so Pongo and Perdita go on this long search to find them. And there's a bunch of characters along the way. There's... Um, you know, there's a cat named Sergeant, there's a horse named Captain, there's a dog named Colonel who help along with them. And uh, it's basically like this, like this whole chase scene, like with the dogs trying to find their way back home during winter and Jasper and Horace and Corilla trying to capture the dogs, especially since they know that the police are after them as well, because that's when they reported it to the, um, to the police and the, there's newspapers about them. So... Yeah, I think that you're absolutely right. There's a lot. I mean, this movie is a little bit slower than the previous movies. And also, you really need to get invested in order for you to, uh, like, really, um, you know, find out the core of the story. But for the most part, the villain is the one that pretty much steals the show. She is just so entertaining that, you know, stuff, you know, when you go back to, like, Pongo or Perdita or Roger and Anita, it's like, you know, it, it kind of slows down the movie a bit. And you know, you go back to uh, you know, that live action remake, which actually I think was one of the very first live action remakes they ever did of a of an animated Disney film several years ago. There's a reason they had to more or less make Glenn Close as Cruella the selling point of this mo- of that of the remake, because that was what was pretty much going to drive was that was what was the that was what the um the most memorable part. Of the animated film, it was going to be the most um, drawing card of the live action remake as well. And for that matter, I, which is why I'd say Krill was also the, one of the primary selling points of the animated TV series as well. Right. And what, when, he's, when he's referring to the animated TV series, he was referring to the one that came out in um, 97, the uh, animated series that was done on the Disney Channel that was done by Jim Jenkins and David Campbell. Uh, this was right after they did Disney's Doug, and they were doing that around the same time as that and PB and J Otter. So, yeah, Corella is definitely um, a, a major selling point of the animated series as well, because... I, I Okay, so here's the thing. I saw the first episode when I was doing that video on Is Disney's Doug Is Really That Bad video. I saw the first episode, and my goodness, it's so dull. For people who are complaining about, like, oh, Nickelodeon's Doug is so boring. I mean, I can understand that for people who didn't grow up with Slices of Life cartoons, like, after uh, Doug. And then, you know, they saw stuff like Hey Arnold and all that stuff, and they were accustomed to that, which... You know, I can I, I can understand your justification on that. And, you know, I can see, like, looking back on it, it's not as fleshed out or deep as the others. But I can still see Doug okay, and I can understand its flaws and its, you know, lim- and, you know, the fact that it hasn't aged very well compared to the other Nicktoons. For those who are saying, like, that stuff is boring, I can definitely understand about this show. This show is so dull and boring. The fact that they completely made it Americanized and it takes place in San Francisco and they decided to move over to a farm instead of a plantation. Ugh, I I mean, I really don't like farms too much in like, you know, um, in like, um, you know, TV shows or movies or anything like that, because I just find them to be so drawn and dull i mean i I mean unless of course if you're able to play it like really well into the atmosphere like charlotte's web and then the dogs they decided to focus on they're just like one-dimensional stereotypes uh i like you know i can understand lucky and patch being the focus but then they had a character that was only exclusive in the books and then you have roly probably the worst dog out of the worst puppy out of all of them because all of the whole shtick of him is that he's always hungry and that's pretty much it. So, and the fact that, yeah, so Cruella DeVille had to really stand out in this animated series. Now I haven't seen the new one yet, so I cannot say anything about that yet. I don't even, I mean, is, I think that there's only been like one or two episodes that have been out as of the making of this podcast. So I haven't seen it. And um, I also haven't seen uh, the 101 Dalmatians two patches in London movie either. So, um, but I have seen the two live action movies. The first one is 
Uh, they did, you know, add in a bunch of things to it. Like instead of a musician, they made Roger into a video game designer, which I guess they wanted to, you know, make it more modern for the kids. It's like, oh, look, this kid is playing on a Nintendo 64 or what, or a PC game or whatever. So, yeah, I mean, like that part hasn't really aged very well. I mean, like, the, you know, Roger and Anita are still the same typical couple and, um, you know, Pongo and Perdita don't talk in this one, which, you know, it makes a lot of sense because I guess they wanted to make it more grounded. But, you know, the villains are the ones that stand out the most. You know, Glenn Close and Hugh Laurie, uh, you know, as Jasper is hilarious. And um, the actor who played as Horace, who also plays as Mr. Weasley in the Harry Potter movies, is also awesome as well. So, yeah, once again, the movies are, I mean, the villains are the best part of the movies. And they really put that to the T. I mean, whenever that you see, like, Disney crossover specials or what have you, you're going to see Cruella de Vil. You will not see any of the other characters because they just don't really matter. So, yeah, I think that for the most part, uh, 101 Dalmatians is a really nice movie. You know, it has a decent story and it has, you know, somewhat decent characters. But the villain is the one you're going to remember the most. So... Yeah, let's talk about the next movie, which um, out of the lineup of the Silver Era, this is my least favorite. I'm sorry for those who like this movie. So, yeah, The Sword and the Stone. Yeah, The Sword and the Stone, for those who don't know, this was essentially like a side project from one of the Disney animators because Disney was working on a Chanticleer movie, uh, a story about the talking rooster, which was based off of a play around 1900. And... They were hard at work at it. They were almost like finished with like the concept art and the and the drawings and all that stuff. But Disney hated the idea when he saw what the animator was doing for the Sword in the Stone about like this animated story about King Arthur. They were like, let's do that movie instead. And I think that it, because of that, it suffered horribly because of it. Because the story is just so dull. The characters, I mean, especially with you know Wart, aka Arthur. It's so bland, and, you know, the only things that you're going to remember about this movie are Arthur, Archimedes, and Mad Madam Mim. Anything else, I don't remember a single thing about this movie. I saw it once as a kid and didn't really gravitate to it at all, and then when I saw it recently, I was like, I remember why I don't remember this movie. Well, this is going to be one of those cases we're going to have to agree to disagree. This is probably... Maybe my biggest guilty pleasure of the Disney films. I know that in retrospect, Harry Hood, it's not among the favorites among a lot of people, especially online, but this was one of my favorites growing up. And I would say it's because, yeah, outside of the character of Arthur, it is a heavily character-driven story. Merlin, I think, in his relationship with Archimedes and their two contrasting um, beliefs in Arthur... It, it really is an entertaining thing to go. Um, I, I would say one of my still all-time favorite funniest scenes in all of Disney history is when Archimedes just goes into a laughing fit with after Merlin's experiment with a flying with a model airplane completely bombs. Just him, just hit him, just Archimedes's laughter exactly how it goes, just going. Heavy breathing and bug-eyed and everything. It's just something I remember with such joy from this begin from beginning to end. And then, yes, even though she her presence in the film is pretty small compared to most other Disney villains, Madame Mim is still, for my money, one of the most entertaining villains in all of Disney history. To the point where I am thanking my lucky stars that to this point. I say to this point because I haven't seen the third one yet. She wasn't in any of the Descendants films. And I'm thanking my lucky stars <laughs> that that didn't happen and she didn't get screwed up by any of those movies. That's just how much I enjoyed her character. But, I mean, I will say that the story itself, now looking from an objective perspective, it does almost kind of suffer the same things that like Alice in Wonderland and Peter Pan does. And that it does seem to be a very point-to-point -point story, so to speak, which really is kind of an issue with a lot of these um, King Arthur adaptations as a whole. Like, everyone has to figure, like, these, ex these exact plot points have to happen in the course of the story, and they don't take a lot of detail into what leads to these plot elements ha occurring. But for me, there's just enough of the characters Arthur, yes, Arthur perhaps notwithstanding, 
There's just so many characters that just play their roles so over the top and so entertaining that I can't help but like this movie. That's fair. I mean, like I said before, I've only seen it a handful of times as a kid, and it didn't really leave that much of an impression. But other than Archimedes, Merlin, and Mad Madam Min, which apparently she is really popular in Japan. Like, uh, there's a reason why they included her in the Kingdom Hearts games. And also, you know, she has a bit of an attraction, I think, in Dis- and you know, in, in Tokyo Disneyland. So she has a big following over there. And also... a you know, we'll talk about this another time, but another character that has a huge following in Japan is Marie from the Aristocats. She, you know, apparently, like, she is so popular over there. There is so much fan art, and there's even a manga focusing on her, alongside with um, a, a different owner, which is kind of baffling. But I guess at the same time, you know, Japanese people and cats, they think it's cute. And and I guess, you know, Mad Mad and Mim's, you know, crazy antics, you know, also, you know, was very popular as well. So I can see that for sure. And uh, another thing that I do need to talk about this movie is that, you know, I, I guess I can, it's, you know, very similar to what you were saying earlier about this is kind of like a little bit of episodic because that's how the King Arthur stories are. But the, the, the kind of a disadvantage here is that a lot of the King Arthur stories that we're familiar with when he's younger, they don't really are dealt that much. We just get to him getting the sword and, you know, him meeting up with Merlin and also, um, you know, him saving Camelot and all that kind of stuff, which, you know, now that we're going into more of his child self, um, you know, him, you know, going through that, you know, backstory about his father and his brother not, you know, treating him very well and all that stuff and being treated like a servant akin to Cinderella. And I guess that, you know, maybe and the fact that, you know, throughout the movie you have, you know, Merlin teaching uh, Arthur about how to be a king, transforming into animals, which is actually pretty cool. I mean, it kind of, like, bores me after a while. I will say this much. You're comparing Sir Ector to uh, Lady Tremaine. I had that that same uh, mindset watching this as a kid. However, I will say this. In later seasons, um, uh, later years of re-watching the movie, I will say this much about Sir Ector. He does come off, yes, as maybe a very strict, uh, a a strict, almost, um, um, which is what I'm looking for, uh, oh, oh, guess the M word, sorry, Mil- military style type of discipline structure he has. However, unlike Lady Tremaine, there are some bits and pieces now and then where he really does care, did care for Arthur. It's, made, it's more or less suggested that he took Arthur under his wing out of his own free will. And he was very, very, um, accepting of the fact at the end that Arthur was do, was uh, fated to become king and was asking for his forgiveness. But you could tell that Arthur didn't, even when he got, if he got angry with him in like earlier in the second act, he never hated Sir Ector. He, I think he always in, in understood that above all else, Ector and Kay gave him a home when no, very, obviously very few other people did. And I did think he always appreciated that. If anything else, I would have, if there's anything I would have loved to have seen that could have finished off that movie was, maybe it would have been nice to see Arthur give Hector and Kay like a spot in his round table so much to, aptly, to help him firmly show that there were no hard feelings about it. That Arthur knew that yes, Kay, uh, Hector could be very gruff and disciplinarian, but he really did care for his ward in that sense. That's something that maybe didn't get. That's that one thing I will give you that maybe that didn't get as much um, description that it probably should have in the movie. Sure, I can I can definitely see that for sure. But another thing that you know I, I think. But to be fair, you know this movie did bring in a lot of um, you know stuff that most people don't really give credit for. It's, you know, the fact that Merlin is kind of like breaking the fourth wall constantly talking about like modern technology. And, you know, I guess this is kind of like a prototype of what the genie would be in Aladdin because he would break a, he would break the fourth wall so many times on modern pop culture humor and inventions that wouldn't be invented for like several thousand, you know, several hundred years. So, I guess you could say that Merlin was kind of like the starting point in which like, hey, you know, let's make a movie that has like a fun side character. Exactly. I think and I think that's 
probably at least one of the reasons why it does have some it does have its some following for some people. There are still a number of individuals that have, that look upon this movie with fondness, myself being one of them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and also that scene with um, the magic uh, duel with Mad Madam Mim and Merlin is just awesome. That's probably my favorite scene in the entire movie. And I can understand why, you know, when they were showing this on, you know, the Disney Channel, they always show that scene. And maybe, like, occasionally the scene in which when, you know, Merlin and Arthur turn into animals. But, um, yeah, I think that for the most part... You know, this movie is pretty flawed because we already know the behind the scenes issues in terms of this was like not even the this was not a movie that they were even working on. I mean, they were working on a Chanticleer movie and then one guy just so happened to be drawing stuff on King Arthur and they were like, let's do that instead. And so I guess that I, I think I like to think that this stuff was kind of like a little rushed. And another thing that we have to note here is that. I think at this point in time, this is when the animation is going to get recycled a lot, by the way. Like when we get to the, the when we, we're going to be talking about the bronze era or the, you know, the, the, the dark era or some people like to call it. Uh, we're going to be talking about that in December where that's going to be apparent throughout the 70s. But the ne- the final movie that we're going to be talking about, we're going to see some of the you know the you know we're going to see a lot of that so let's talk about the f- uh, final movie in the limelight so the last movie that Walt Disney was working on right before he died the jungle book so there's an interesting history about the jungle book i'm sure a lot of people have heard about it that you know it's based off of the story by Rudyard Kipling and Disney came in with the book one day and he told his animators and his artists and his writers have you read this book if you have not, let's just toss the book out and let's just have fun with it. And this kind of pissed off the Kipling estate. The fact that they called the main character Mowgli instead of Mowgli. The fact that they, you know, they folk, they've they made it more child friendly as opposed to a coming of age story where Mowgli was, you know, being raised in the jungle. And then he took down Shere Khan and then he grew up into an adult. And it was kind of like a, a battle between man and animals and stuff like that. So, yeah, the fact that they decided to make it more fun, it's the, the, the estate was still angry about it, even still to this day. It's like a, you know, the akin of what we talked about earlier about, like, you know, people in England do not like Winnie the Pooh or the um, uh, the Edgar Rice Burroughs estate didn't really care about the Disney's interpretation of Tarzan. So with this, I can kind of understand because uh, I listened to an episode of the Animated Anarchy podcast about the Jungle Book 2. Uh, also, by the way, uh, shout out to their episode on the Sword in the Stone, which I highly recommend if you want to listen to discussions on 20 minutes on film restoration, which is still one of the most interesting things that they talked about. But they're brought up about the Jungle Book, uh, the original, right before they went over to the sequel. And they were talking about how, you know, this was a movie that Walt Disney was working on right before he died. And, you know, they had to deal with the Xerox stuff and, you know, the the the, the, um, the animations they had to pull in, like, you know, repeating some animations from uh, Sword of the Stone. Like, for example, you have the scene in which when Mowgli is um, meeting up with his wolf brother, and then he gets licked on it's a similar scene in which when arthur is being met up with dogs in his home and he's being licked on as well it's the same exact scene even if you look at arthur and mowgli they're the same design and also you know they were talking about like you know what they you know the 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 water animation that they did and the fact that they painted like some certain scenes black so that it can reflect the grayness of some of the backgrounds and all that kind of stuff so, yeah, I would recommend that you listen to those podcasts to get a more detailed stuff about the animation stuff. But for the most part, let's talk about the story. So it kind of plays similar to the Kipling story in which you have a, a baby who was left out of the jungles of India and uh, the panther Bagheera decided to drop him over to a wolf family so that he can be able to be raised properly and being protected by a tiger named Shere Khan. So Shere Khan does wander into that part of the jungle one day and so they have to take Mowgli back to the man village he doesn't want to go there because he wants to stay in the jungle and along the way he meets up with a whole bunch of characters such as Baloo and Ka and uh the vultures and then eventually he goes over to the man village where he is being lured in by a girl who sings a song about gathering water and then that's when 
you know, he decides to stay there. And once again, very similar to the previous movies, I have to say that the story is definitely one of the weakest things about this movie and the main character as well. The reason why I do remember this movie fondly is because of some of the songs, which was actually written by the Sherman brothers. And this will be the last movie that they would work on for many, many years because they left to do other stuff for Hanna-Barbera and a bunch of other animation companies. And then afterwards, um, uh, let's see. I think that for the most part, um, you know, they brought in. Um, yeah. And, and I think that for the most part, yeah. The, um, you know, the, it, it, and it once again, like, you know, similar to what we were saying before about like the episodic structure, it's the same thing in which like you go from Mowgli and, you know, being raised by wolves, then he's taken over to Bagheera, then he's confronted with Ka, then he meets up with the elephant army, then he meets up with Baloo, then he's taken over to King Louie. It's, it, I mean, it goes through the same, you know, story structure again. So, yeah, I mean, I'm kind of noticing a pattern here. You are correct there, and I would say that if, if it's as, it's one of these cases where, I'll say this, if you end up having a making a movie that maybe doesn't have the best story structure possible. The one way you could probably get away with that is if you put your all-out effort into the characters themselves. And I'll say this, what probably sells the Jungle Book, much like a number of these other movies we talked about, yeah, it's the music and the characters. Just give, just give all the credit in the world to the performances of Phil Harris as Baloo, Sebastian Cabot as Bagheera, um, Sterling Holloway as Ka, Louis Prima as King Louis especially. And also, let's say this, just, again, Shere Khan, portrayed by George Sanders, might be the most intimidating villain since Lady Tremaine. He just, when he is on present, on camera, he just owns every scene he's in, in that, in that mindset. Oh, absolutely. Like when you see Shere Khan, you know that this is not a character that you do not want to mess around with. He has the sharp claws and the intimidating eyes and the sharp teeth and his roar. Like, you know for sure that when you see him, you run. You do not try to confront him like Mowgli does, which he is an idiot in this movie. Like <laughs> the fact that, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Like he is one of my least favorite protagonists in a Disney movie. The fact that he is so stubborn that, oh, he doesn't want to go to the man village because he wants to stay in the jungle when they're doing it for his own protection. And, you know, the, he's saying like, oh, I can protect myself. I don't need anybody's help. When he clearly does. And it's been shown multiple times he cannot defend himself from king louis and his men and he cannot defend himself from Ka because he was captured and hypnotized twice and then when finally when you know he meets up with Sher khan and you know he's about to grab a stick and then he roars and he almost backs out i mean if baloo wasn't there to grab him by the tail he would have been dead like no question like it, it's not even a, uh, it's not even, it, it's an obvious statement that you know th this is a character that I cannot root for. I'm sorry. Like I will uh, say you this. Know, I will say this. Um, the Jungle Book live action remake is one of the few live action remakes I've actually seen. And if I'll give it any type of credit, they do a better job developing some of those characters and Mowgli in particular. They make him. At least somewhat more formidable, I would say, in that in that film. And I do think the fact that they gave that live action movie its own individual take on the story, much like they gave the animated film its own more individual take compared to the to the Rudyard Kipling book originally, that's something I will give at least that film credit for. Yeah, and believe it or not, around for some reason around the nineties. The Jungle Book was everywhere. Like there was the 94 live action remake where it had, a, you know, Mowgli as an adult. Then there was another one that was like a younger version of Mowgli called The Jungle Book Mowgli Story. Then there was Jungle Cubs. There was Tailspin. Yeah, like the Jungle Book was everywhere in the 90s. There were even video games of it for like the Sega Genesis and Super Nintendo. So yeah, for a while, like it had a bit of a resurgence around the 90s. And then, you know, when they... When they featured, um, you know, um, Tailspin and they had uh, Jim Cummings providing the voice of King Louis because Louis Prima had passed away, his widow was so angry 
because of, you know, th that, you know, they thought, you know, she thought it was desecrating her husband's legacy. And so with House of Mouse, that's why they did King Larry. And then when they did the Jungle Book 2, the, you know, you know, King Louis wasn't in that movie. And so they had to give another king. And yeah, that's the reason why we don't have a King Louis in any of those incarnations. But I don't think we have to worry too much about that now because the widow's dead. And I think that, you know, they were able to utilize King Louis again in the 2016 movie. So it is, it is interesting that, yeah, people got so yeah, a lot of people got bent out of shape for how Jim Cummings was able to just so perfectly duplicate the voice of King Louis. But Tony J kind of got spared with how well he was able to duplicate Shere Khan's voice in that show as well. Exactly, yeah, and he did, he did it again in Jungle Book too. So uh, yeah, like I think that was great casting for Tony J uh, as Shere Khan as well. He did a really good job of it. Um, I think that for the most part. Um, you know, Jungle Book also has its legacy as well. I mean, sure, the, char the characters and the music are the ones that make it stand out because, you know, that's why we were able to get st such things as Tailspin and the Jungle Cubs. And, you know, then after a while, you know, I guess, you know, John Favreau saw that they, they were able to do things better in the 2016 movie. And then Andy Serkis did his own version of the Jungle Book in the Netflix movie, which I have not seen. So, yeah, there's a lot of good material in the original uh, book of, you know, the Jungle Book with Roger Kipling. Like there's there's a lot of things there that make people interested in wanting to do adaptations of it. And, um, yeah, I, I think that the fact that, you know, Disney unfortunately passed away during the production of it due to lung cancer because he was an avid smoker. Mm. Um, he uh, so, yeah, I mean, like, yeah, I, I think that, you know, the fact that it was able to end it off on this and then we would go over to the bronze era or the dark era, whatever you like to call it. Um, yeah, I think this is going to be the point in which we're going to be seeing a lot of regressing a little bit, uh, at least toward like the late 70s and 80s. But we're not going to be talking about that until December, if you can believe it, because that's when the Aristocats is going to be celebrating its uh, 50th anniversary. But we won't be going into that until much later on. So, yeah, that's it for the most part of this episode of Casual Chat. So, uh, Chris, uh, once again, thank you so much for coming on by. Absolutely. So, yeah, uh, let us know where we can find you, plug or promote anything you want, and, uh, you know, share what, you're, what you got coming up. Well, depending on how, uh, when this uh, podcast is going to be released, this, um, we are, this February, we are currently celebrating the 10th anniversary of TV Trash. I believe my 10th anniversary celebration live stream will be coming up uh, this coming Saturday, February the um, 16th, I believe it will be, uh, let me see, Saturday's 18th, Sunday, um, I'm sorry about this, trying to count, but it's going to be like the second Saturday upcoming of February, and then the following Monday will be the 10th anniversary review on TV Trash, so just, uh, like I said, that will be, uh, the live stream will be this coming Saturday, uh, and uh, the following Monday, you can catch the live stream on, on my Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash Rowdy Chris Moore. Of course, the embed for that is up 24-7 on the new Rowdy C main page at rowdyc.com slash main.html. I'm trying, still trying to work to get that one more permanently affixed there. But, yeah, the, the live stream to celebrate the 10th anniversary followed by the, um, followed by the official... 10th anniversary TV trash will be coming up in just a few days, I believe. Awesome. Sounds great. Um, so, yeah, thank you so much for listening, everybody. Let us know in the comments below about your thoughts on the Disney Silver Era or the Disney Restoration Era, whatever you want to call it. Uh, what are your favorite movies from that particular era? What are your least favorite? And... Uh, let us know about some of your favorite characters, some of your favorite songs, um, some moments in animation that made you blown away, even though that these movies were done like, you know, 60 something years ago. So, yeah, please let us know. And uh, yeah, everybody, uh, that's it. I hope to see you around soon and take care.